I'm just going to crack on despite the music. Um, you've learned a couple of things today, uh, but I'm not too good at these style talks, and I think now I'm about to commit Pokemon suicide by playing you a video that is irrationally long. Um, but I do want you to remember this video, I want you to think about what's going on uh, with this poor patient. So this is Paul Orrit, he's a rider at the TT where uh, I spend a lot of my holidays uh, covering these races. And what I want you to think about is what happens to Paul during this event. You're going to see it real time now, and I want you to think about what's going on with Paul right there. This is real speed, about 140, 150 miles an hour. So right there, right now, what is Paul? blood pressure, what is his heart rate, what is his respiratory rate, does he have high intracranial pressure, low intracranial pressure, does he have uh, high blood pressure, low blood pressure. Actually, if we can think about that and understand that, then we will begin to understand what to do for head injuries in the pre environment. Now actually this isn't uh, some horrible type of uh, video, um, Paul did well after this, he's not seriously injured, he had a few limb fractures and scapular fractures and what, uh, what have you. But if you had gotten to him, uh, like some of us who involved in motorsport, you'd find that he was not breathing, uh, his pulses are fixed and dilated, and that he has no pulse, and in fact he, has, he looks dead for a period of time. And I just want to, I suppose, ask you to think about that in all the patients that you see when you get to them, what happened to them before you got there. So, oh dear. What does happen? Uh, well, what does the literature tell us? Uh, back in 1874, uh, experiments uh, were conducted in Germany that showed that repeated small blows to the head of an animal led to death by respiratory paralysis. Other authors found the same thing. Indeed, if you look at the animal literature, uh, all of the animal experiments, and I didn't have room to put a pig on this slide, but pigs uh, do exactly the same thing. They all demonstrate breathing and respiratory problems uh, with head injury. Uh, and the most compelling thing about it is it's not just all animals. It's different animal model, uh, head injury models, whether it's percussive, missile, uh, or wake up, you name it, they all show the same thing. And it all happened, it all uh, is demonstrated no matter what research laboratory you're working around the world, whether it's France or Germany or the States, they've all demonstrated this apnea after head injury. So, what if you looked up impact brain apnea in the books? Well, uh, you probably wouldn't find it because uh, it's not there. That's a term that we sort of phrase and use uh, in London. But the original uh, researchers did coin this phrase, primary brain apnea, or the critical phase of head injury. But of course it's not in the ATLS manual, it's not in current text on trauma, it's not in head injury uh, textbooks, even the most current ones. And uh, the only place actually you will find it, if you uh, go onto uh, Amazon and get some old head injury textbooks from the States from the 1970s and 80s, and then you will see that this was a recognized phenomenon and part of everyday teaching. So what do we understand about the pathophysiology of apnea? Well, we know it's mediated by the brain stem down here uh, in the medulla oblongata. Uh, we know that the severity of the apnea is proportional to the energy exchange, but most importantly, we know that there is no structural brain injury uh, in those animals. They don't have diffuse axonal injury or laceration or hematoma. But one other thing that we do know is associated with a huge catecholamine release. So let me just take you through one of the papers that demonstrate this. And this is a, a rat population who being popped on the head uh, with mild, moderate and severe injury, and they were monitored. So, oh, gosh, that slide doesn't come out. Mm. 
Okay, I'm going to have to skip through those. Some, some of these may be distorted. But what I want to show you here is this is the rats breathing here. They've been popped on the head. And what you can see is they've had normal ratty breaths, ratty breaths. They're popped on the head. They stop breathing. Um, if you go down to even uh, more severe uh, injuries, gosh, these are all a bit messed up. But this is another pop on the head here. This is the breathing of the rat, and you can see ratty breaths, ratty breaths. They stop, then some odd ventilation comes back. And associated with that uh, is hypertension. One of the key features of all of these studies shows that if you put in rescue breaths during the apnea, then these, uh, these rats return to normality. So this concept of rescue breaths absolutely produces normality. So that apnea uh, that stops you breathing, perhaps for minutes and minutes and minutes, is not associated uh, with devastating head injury. Part of those studies showed that you get a big castellanium surge from all of this. And we know that this is not a response to ICP. Again, it's from the brainstem. And if you look at the hearts of these rats, they're full of hemorrhage and bleeding, uh, and they demonstrate ECG changes, like you see in subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, you'll be familiar with that concept. But I do want you to think about this poor heart that's trying to beat in the middle of all of this hypoxia and acidosis. Then it beats against this huge catecholamine surge where the blood pressure of the rat goes up to 200 millimeters of mercury. Well, eventually that heart dies and uh, starts to dysfunction and you end up uh, with the death. Unfortunately, there are no human studies uh, of patients uh, that have been bopped on the head. Uh, it is pretty much reliant on uh, sports to demonstrate this. In the literature, there are a few case reports. Uh, papers demonstrate watershed ischemia in head injured patients uh, points towards this disease. The paediatric non-accidental injury, shaken baby syndrome, now believe or well, some people believe that this is due to growing in brain apnea, that these children aren't shaken uh, uh, at all. And of course, all of us have dealt with central shock, the head injured patients that we can't manage and we can't resuscitate. This is the second most important slide of the talk, is that if you can read this paper by McIver in The Lancet in 1958, and I just draw your attention to this one, this sentence, we believe that anoxia is the main cause of death in patients who survive uh, the accident and die later, that actually this paper proposes there's no such thing really as head injury. It's all hypoxia, all of the serious diseases related to hypoxia. So we do need to think about our understanding of trauma epidemiology and what all this hypotension means in dead and dying patients and the role that we have as uh, uh, EMS dispatchers or EMS providers in treating head injury patients. So my advice, I suppose, uh, to how do we look after these patients better in the future? Well, we need to understand the disease. Um, this is a Hebron Collider. This is the Higgs boson. Uh, they couldn't actually see what they were looking for. They were looking for echoes of it. So when you see a patient now uh, that is um, shocked and head injured, but you find no cause for that shock, deep in, dig into that patient and you'll probably find evidence of brain apnea and it's only when we start to address that, perhaps through the dispatch and the control rooms, we'll make these patients uh, have a chance of surviving. Thanks very much.